Welcome back to Millennial Reign YouTube channel. I am Masayoshi Motomayor, and as always, as it states in my about section, these are just my study notes. Uh, I do not represent or am the official spokesman for any particular religion. I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so I will be not only utilizing scriptures from the Old Testament and New Testament, but also modern-day apostles as well, and modern-day scripture. So, let's go ahead and move forward. We're going to be speaking about during the last half of the seven-year tribulation, the telestial law-abiding people are wiped off the earth so that during the millennial reign, after the tribulation, only the righteous will live. What is the gathering slash call out? Is it what some call the rapture? When is that? And if the earth changes from telestial to terrestrial, how do our bodies change from telestial to terrestrial in order to still be on earth and not die? How do we endure through the tribulation as well as be in the presence of a glorified resurrected God, Jesus Christ, when he returns? Okay, let's get into it. Uh, this is from the uh, 200 Years of Light, uh, the Future of the Church. This is the prophet, President Nelson, preparing the world for the, the Savior's second coming. Okay, uh, this was in April 2020 when he spoke this. Uh, it says, Today the Lord's work in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is moving forward at an accelerated pace. The Church will have an unprecedented, unparalleled future I hath not seen, nor heard, nor ear heard, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, and Doctrine and Covenants 76, 10. Remember the fullness of Christ's ministry lies in the future. The prophecies of the second coming have yet to be fulfilled. We are just building up to the climax of this last dispensation when the Savior's second coming becomes a reality. The time is coming when those who do not obey the Lord will be separated from those who do. Doctrine and Covenants 86, 1-7 through seven. Our safest insurance is to continue to be worthy of admission to his holy house. The greatest gift you could give, the, give to the Lord is to keep yourself unspotted from, from the world. Worthy to attend his holy house, his gift to you will be the peace and security of knowing that you are worthy to meet him. Okay, let's check out the footnotes. Um, the time is coming when those who do not obey the Lord will be separated from those who do. That's Dr. Comes 86, 1 through 7. This footnote scripture is the parable of the wheat and the tares. Verse 3 is telling. Satan sitteth to reign. Behold, he soweth the tares. Wherefore, the tares choke the wheat and drive the church into the wilderness. Mosiah 16, 2. Uh, footnotes to Doctrine and Covenants 6354. Uh, and until that hour, there will be foolish virgins among the wise. And at that hour cometh the entire separation of the righteous and the wicked. And in that day will I send mine angels to pluck out the wicked and cast them into the unquestionable fire. Doctrine and Covenants 1, 12, 23, 26, uh, 226 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, darkness cover the, covereth the earth, and gross darkness the minds of the people, and all flesh has become corrupt before my face. Behold, vengeance cometh speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth, a day of wrath and a day of burning, and a day of desolation, of weeping and mourning and of lamentations. And as a whirlwind, it shall come upon the face of the earth, saith the Lord. And upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. First among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name, and have not known me, and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. So he's first going to bring this wrath to the saints, those who say that they know him, not that they've heard of him, those who have taken his name upon them. That's what we do weekly, right, with the sacrament. Those who have known, have professed to know my name, but have not known me, blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, in his church. Okay, 
The field is white and all ready to harvest. Jobs is Fielding Smith, Conference Report, April 1946. Warning of calamities to come. We have no right to close our eyes, and we have no right to be silent and shut our eyes against the warnings of the Lord has given and placed before us, which we are commanded to declare to the nations of the earth. God is at the helm. M. Russell Ballard, 2015. 20 years ago, the first presidency of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles issued the family, a proclamation of the world. In that inspired document, we concluded the following. We warn that individuals who violate covenants of chastity, who abuse spouse or offering, uh, offspring, who fail to fulfill family responsibilities will one day stand accountable for God. Further, we warn that the disintegr disintegration of the family will bring upon individuals, communities, nations, the calamities foretold by ancient and modern uh, prophets. As apostles, we reaffirm this solemn warning again today. Please remember that commandments and covenants are priceless truths and doctrines found in the old ship Zion, where God is at the helm. Okay. So what is the purpose to be gathered out of the cities and into the wilderness? Well, there's a lot of individuals who call it the call out. Okay, we're going to look at some scriptures, some quotes, to kind of find out where that came from. So we're looking at here two things, physically and spiritually leaving Babylon. Okay, so first off, I'm going to show you this picture here and ask the question, if there's desolations and plagues and sickness and riots and all of this happening in the cities, would you want to still be in the cities? Is that your main goal there? Building a brand new house, you know, putting a, you know, applying for a brand new 30 year mortgage. That, that's what you want to do is, it, you know, just just have that in the back of your mind. Let's take a look here. Heber C. Kimball. The judgments of God will be poured out upon the wicked to the extent that our elders far and near will be called home. Or in other words, the gospel will be taken from the Gentiles and the Gentiles and later on will be carried to the Jews. The western boundaries of the state of Missouri will be swept so clean of its inhabitants of, that as Pre President Young tells us, when we return to that place, there will be not as there will will not be as much as a yellow dog to wag its tail. Before that day comes, however, the saints will be put to a test that will try the very best of them. The pressure will become so great that the righteous among us will cry unto the Lord day and night until deliverance comes. In 1856, that is 74 years ago, a small group of friends convened in the house of the Lord called the Endowment House, and the conversation was about the isolated condi uh, condition of the Latter-day Saints. Yes, said Brother Heber, we think we are secure here in the chambers of these everlasting hills where we can close the doors of the canyons against the mobs and persecutors, the wicked and the vile, who have always beset us with violence and robbery. But I want to say to you, my brethren, the time is coming when we will be mixed up in these now peaceful valleys to the extent that it will be difficult to tell the face of a saint from a sinner, uh, for, uh, I'm sorry, from the, the face of a saint and an enemy against the people of God. Then is the time to look out for the great sieve. There will be great sifting time. Many will fall. For I say unto you, there is a test, a test, a test coming. He further said, this church has before it many close places through which it will have to pass Close places before which it will have to pass before the work of God is crowned with glory. The difficulties will be of such character that a man or woman who does not possess a personal knowledge or witness will fall. Let me read that again. The difficulties will be such character that the man or woman who does not possess a personal knowledge or witness will fall. So let's think about that for a second. So... <clears throat> If we're supposed to have this this constant guiding, directing influence of the Holy Ghost, that that's a little bit more than just having a testimony, right? That that sounds like baptism of fire, the the baptism of the Holy Ghost, right? That mighty change of heart, so that you have the Holy Ghost with you and and continually guiding you, and then 
it, it brings you to something, right? There's a process of sanctification we talked about in the last two videos, right? So we're, we're going to kind of dive in here. So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind and just kind of go into a little bit more detail when you hear these phrases, personal knowledge or witness, right? Okay, if you have not got this testimony, you must live right and call upon the Lord and cease not until you obtain it. Wow. Okay, so if you don't already have a personal knowledge or witness, okay, I'm not talking about just, you know, well, it feels good. I get the warm fuzzies every time I go to church. No, no, no. He says, if you don't have this, you must live right, call upon the Lord and cease not until you obtain it. Remember these things. The time will come when no man or woman will be able to endure on borrowed light. Each will have to be guided by the light within themselves if you do not have the knowledge that Jesus is the Christ. How can you stand? Okay, so that's uh, Hebrews Kimball, uh, 1868. Also, uh, J. Golden Kimball, Gift of Prophecy, uh, the Gift of Prophecy Conference Report, October 1930. Okay, so um, there's a difference between having faith in Christ and having the knowledge. You need to study that. There's a huge difference, right? That's why Christ is the author and finisher of our faith, because first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and when your faith is finished, you now know, because what? Who have you then seen face to face? Side study. Go for it. Okay. Let's move to Revelation chapter 18. The saints are called out of Babylon, lest they partake of her sins. She falls and is lamented by her supporters. Who's her? Babylon. That's the chapter heading for chapter 18. Let's dive into chapter 4. I'm sorry, uh, verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. That you may uh, that ye be not partakers of her sin, that ye receive not of her plagues. Okay, let's look at footnote four B. Takes you to Genesis nineteen fourteen, and Lot went out, spake unto his sons in law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get ye out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons in law. Footnote 4c takes you to Isaiah 52, 11. Depart ye, depart ye. Go ye out from thence. Touch no unclean thing. Go ye out in the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Verse 8. Uh, we're going back to verse 8 in chapter 18. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. All right. Let's go over to Joseph Fielding Smith. He's the prophet Joseph Smith, 1993, Deseret Book. And it shall come to pass among the wicked that every man that will not take his sword against his neighbor must needs flee to Zion for safety. Doctrine and Covenants 4568. And that the gathering together upon the land of Zion and upon her stakes may be for a defense and for a refuge from the storm. And from wrath, when it shall be poured out without mixture upon the whole earth. Doctrine and Covenants 115.6 For it is ordained that in Zion and her stakes and in Jerusalem, for places which I have appointed for refuge, shall be the places for your baptisms for your dead. Doctrine and Covenants 124.36 Without Zion and a place for deliverance, ye must fall, because the time is near, when the sun will be darkened and the moon turned to blood and the stars fall from heaven, and the earth reel to and fro. Then, if this is the case, and if we are not sanctified, okay, first time we're, we're hearing this word sanctified, put it on the counter, sanctified, and gathered to places of God has appointed. Okay, what, 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 what did he just say? He just said, if we're not sanctified, and gathered to the places that God has appointed, all right, remember this. With all our former professions and our great love for the Bible, we must fall. We cannot stand. We cannot be saved. For God will be get, well, God will gather out his saints from among the Gentiles, and then comes desolation and destruction. And none can escape except the pure in heart who are gathered. Okay, did you just hear? Okay, so he just identified what sanctified 
means. He said it's the pure in heart. You ever heard that phrase before? Yes, you have. Side study. Okay, let's continue. Bruce R. McConkie, stand independent above all of the creatures, 1979. And so we raise the warning voice and say, take heed, prepare, watch, and be ready. There is no security in any course except the course of obedience, conformity, and righteousness. Nevertheless, Zion shall escape if she observe to do all things whatsoever I have commanded her, saith the Lord. But if she observe not to do whatever whatsoever I have commanded her, I will visit her according to all her works, with sore affliction, with pestilence, plague, with sword, vengeance, and devouring fire. Doctrine and Covenants 97, 23, 25-26. Okay, that's found in churchjesuschrist.org, the study section, General Conference, 1979. Alrighty. Wilfred Rudolph. Oh, I said that wrong. Wilfred, Wilfred Woodruff. There we go. Okay, this is uh, 1894, uh, women's, uh, Young Women's Journal. Can you tell me where the people who are will be shielded and protected from these great calamities and judgments, which are even now at our door? I'll tell you, the priesthood of God who honor their priesthood and who are worthy of the blessings, who are the ones who shall have the safety and protection. Okay, now, in order to fully understand what he's saying here, you need to study what I mentioned in my last video, Memorable and Unforgettable, uh, section 85, verse 33, also 23, the oath and covenant of the priesthood. Okay, let's go back. They are the only mortal beings. No other people have the right to be shielded from these judgments. They are at our doors. Not even this people will escape them entirely. Okay, so not even the saints are going to escape them entirely. Why? Go back to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 13, when he says, that very, very, very small portion will survive. Okay, let's move forward. Article of Faith number 10, we believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the Ten Tribes, that Zion, the New Jerusalem, will be built upon the American continent, that Christ will reign personally upon the earth, and that the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisical glory. So that is talking about the terrestrial state, right? Moving from telestial to terrestrial. Okay, President Russell M. Nelson, again, uh, future of the church, preparing the world for the Savior's second coming. True, in the early days of the church, conversion often meant immigration as well, but now the gathering takes place in each nation. The Lord has decreed the establishment of Zion, Doctrine Covenants 6, 6 and 11, 6, in each realm where he has given the saints their birth and nationality. The place of gathering for Brazilian saints is in Brazil. The place of gathering for Nigerian saints is in Nigeria. The place of gathering for the Korean saints is in Korea. Zion is, quote, the pure in heart. Dr. Nicholas 97.21. It is wherever righteous saints are. Okay, did you hear what he... So he, he's saying Zion is not the saints... It's not in the location of the saint. It's not in Utah. It's not so there are different places that there are going to be gathering for safety during this last half of the seven year tribulation, the great tribulation as uh, John the Revelator and, and also Matthew describe it as uh, Isaiah calls the last half of the seven year tribulation uh, the day of the Lord or the day of Jehovah technically right. So let's continue finding out. Who the righteous saints are, uh, I will then again refer you to the uh, the tithe of the people, the tenth of the people that Isaiah says in chapter 6, verse 13. Okay, Zion in the midst of Babylon, David R. Stone of the 70, 2006. How useful it would, how, how useful it would be to have an early warning system which would tell us about the approach of evil and allow us to be prepared for it. Hmm, he's got a point there. Uh, sensuality, corruption, and decadence, and worshiping of false gods are to be seen in many cities, great and small, scattered across the globe. As the Lord has said, they seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world. Doctrine and Covenants 116. If Babylon is the city of the world, Zion is the city of God, and the Lord has said of Zion, Zion cannot be built up 
unless it is by the principle and the law. I'm sorry, the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. Doctrine and Covenants 105.5. And for this is Zion, the pure in heart. Okay, that's the second time we've heard this. Doctrine and Covenants 97.21. Okay, so we need to do a side study on why we need to be living celestial laws to be admitted into Zion, which is a terrestrial state. Go ahead and you let me know in the comments section. Okay, Orson Pratt, Journal Discourses 7, 308, Privileges and Experiences of the Saints. I recollect reading the prophecy of Enoch that he, after gathering together his people from the different parts of the earth, the same as we are doing, commenced preaching righteousness to them. Moses 7.19, he built up the city called Zion. The Lord revealed himself to Enoch, Moses 7.67, and he saw him face to face, Doctrine and Covenants 107.49. God walked and talked with him. He dwelt in the midst of the city of Zion for the space of 365 years. And then God took Enoch, city, people, and all to heaven, Moses 7.69. I recollect reading the of Enoch's uh, having gathered his people, that their enemies came up against them to battle. What kind of weapons did Enoch use to destroy his enemies? It says, quote, And he, Enoch, spake the word of the Lord, and the earth trembled, and the mountains fled according to his command, and the rivers of the waters were turned out from their course, and the roar of the lions was heard out of the wilderness, and all nations feared greatly. So powerful was the word of Enoch, and so great was the power of language which God hath given him. Moses 7.13 That was the power given to the priesthood and authority which was conferred upon Enoch in the early ages of the world. Moses 7.27 uh, Moses 7.2 it is also your privilege, ye saints of the living God, to obtain by faith the same blessings and the same power that you shall be appointed upon foreign missions. You can open your mouths by the power of the same spirit that rested upon Enoch, that you can not only teach them what they should do, but prophesy to the people. Doctrine and Covenants 42, 16. And tell them what what shall be in the future. Tell them of the judgments and calamities that shall overtake the wicked. It is your privilege to prophesy to the great and to the low, to the king on his throne, to the great men in high places, to the inhabitants of the earth, and to foretell that which shall befall their cities, villages, nations, spirit, um, nations, and countries and kingdoms, to foretell all of these things. Not by your own wisdom, nor by the spirit of false prophecy, but by the power of the spirit which rested upon Enoch in ancient days. With such qualification, you could go forth and perform the mission appointed to you acceptably in the sight of God. What is the privilege of the servants of God that are remaining here in the midst of the settlements of Zion? It is our privilege to sanctify, oh, that's another sanctify, ourselves and have even greater power than those who go to the nations. Why? Because here is the great central place of gathering, and here should center all the powers of the everlasting priesthood. Here, in our midst, should be poured out the blessing, of, the blessings of the priesthood to their fullest extent. Here, the servants of God should be clothed from on high with the glory of God, and be able to foretell all things which should be for the welfare and the benefit of the children of Zion. All these things belong to the priesthood here. Okay, let's talk about two, two different things here. Um, there's a lot of people asking, what's going to be more effective? Physical preparation or spiritual preparation? W what's better? Well, let me ask you one thing here. If you're going to prepare for the last half of the seven year tribulation, which is technically called the Great Tribulation, or the Day of Jehovah, as Isaiah calls it, would you, what, uh, hunker down in your basement with your guns and your ammo and your food storage and your family and, and write it out? It, it, would you physically do that? Uh, would that protect you 
when a glorified God's toe touches this planet and burns every living thing that is living a telestial law and not a higher law. If you're still living a telestial law, how is that going to protect you with physical preps? Let's move forward. Let's check it out. Brigham Young Journal Discourses 18356. We have no business here other than to build up and establish the Zion of God. It must be done according to the will and law of God. After that pattern and order by which Enoch built up and perfected the former day Zion, which was taken away to heaven. Hence the saying went abroad that Zion had fled. By and by it will, be coming, it will come back again. And as Enoch prepared his people to be worthy of translation, we, through our faithfulness, must prepare ourselves to meet Zion from above, and it shall return to earth, and to abide the brightness and glory of its coming. Well, yeah, you can't really abide the brightness and glory of a of a uh, city that's living a celestial law, unless you're living a higher law as well. Okay, let's continue. My brethren and sisters, I do really delight in hearing our brethren speak on this holy order of heaven. Now, study what that means, the holy order of heaven. Okay, side study. Unity of purpose and action in carrying out the will of our Father has been my theme all the day long. But I have continually pled with the saints not to waste their substance upon the lust of the eye and the flesh, for that is contrary to the will and commandments of God. Okay, Monty S. Nyman, he's a professor of ancient scripture. I like quoting uh, a lot of the times these, uh, these scholars who... Um, they have a lot of input. This was in 1994, January Enzyme. And if you notice the Enzyme, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put in a couple of Enzyme uh, slides in here because there's a lot of nuggets in the Enzymes, or now the Aliahona, that uh, a lot of people really don't read, but it's phenomenal. Okay, uh, this is what the um, Professor of Ancient Scripture, this... Uh, this uh, Monty S. Nyman states, Did worthy people continue to be translated and taken up long after Enoch's city? From the Pearl of Great Price and Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible, we know that righteous people continued to be translated, taken from earth without tasting of death, after the city of Enoch was taken up. In Moses, uh, we read of a vision shown to Enoch all the nations of the earth after Zion was taken up into heaven. Uh, that's Moses 7.23. He was shown the power of Satan that was that was upon the earth, with angels descending and warning the inhabitants of the earth, Moses 7.24.26. And Enoch beheld angels descending out of heaven, bearing testimony of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Ghost fell on many. And they, they were caught up by the powers of heaven unto Zion. Moses 7.27. In the JST, the Joseph Smith translation, we read of the ancient, uh, we read of the days of Melchizedek, who was ordained and high priest after the order of the covenant which God made with Enoch. In referring to Enoch's day, it is recorded that, that this priesthood was after the order of the Son of God and gave men power to control the earth and its elements by the will of God. Joseph Smith's translation, Genesis 14, 27. See also Joseph Smith's translation, uh, Genesis 14, 28 through 31. Uh, through this priesthood, men having this faith, coming up to this order of God, there you go again, order of God, were translated and taken up into heaven. Joseph, uh, Joseph Smith's translation, Genesis 14, 32. Returning to the days of Melchizedek, it is stated that his people wrought righteousness and obtained heaven, and sought for the city of Enoch, which God had been had before taken, separating it from the earth, having reserved it unto the latter days, or the end of the world. Joseph Smith translation, Genesis fourteen thirty four. Okay, thus we have the two witnesses of the translation of individuals between the days of Enoch and the flood, as well as the declaration that the doctrine of translation of righteous men continued even after the flood in the days of Melchizedek. Okay, uh, Monty S. Nyman again, the covenant of Abraham. Abraham's early life. Why did God make a covenant with Abraham? This question can be answered by understanding the life and character 
of Abraham. Now, before I go into this, uh, there's going to be a little bit of cross, um, kind of bleeding through two different things here. I'm going to mention some of this in my next video. I'm going to be making a video of the covenants of Israel, um, letting God prevail. That was our homework assignment between conferences. And so you're going to get kind of a piece of this in what he is saying here. So let me kind of uh, help you understand. I'll, I'll make some emphasis here. Um, like others who God chose to begin at a new, uh, new work among the children of men, Abraham was born into an apostate environment where heathen gods were being worshipped and the people's hearts were set to do evil. Abraham 1, 5 through 6. In spite of growing up in this environment, Abraham followed after righteousness and sought the priesthood to which he was a rightful heir. Uh, obtaining the priesthood, he further sought to magnify it by calling his associates to repentance. But rather than repent, he said that they, in typical apostate fashion, quote, endeavored to take away my life. Abraham 1, 5 through 7, 12, 15. See also verse 1 through 4. In accordance with the Lord's principle of leading the righteous out from among the wicked. Did you hear what he just said? In accordance with the Lord's principle of leading the righteous out from among the wicked, 1 Nephi 17, 35 through 38, Abraham was commanded to leave his father's house and all his kinsfolk being led by the hand of the Lord, Abraham 1, 16 through 18. Exercising faith, Abraham responded to the command, Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. Okay, John Taylor Journal Discourses 21, 2, 5, 3. And when the time comes that these calamities we read of shall overtake the earth, those that are prepared will have the power of translation as they had in former times, and the city will be translated. Let me emphasize that again. When the time comes that these calamities will, we read of shall overtake the earth, those that are prepared, not all of the righteous, or all of this particular group, or all of the covenant people, or all of the saints, those that are prepared, spiritually prepared, not preppers that are physically prepared, those that are prepared will have the power of translation as they had in former times, and the city will be translated. Okay, John Taylor, 2333, General Discourses. How perfect it was in the days of Enoch, we're not told, but everything that they had revealed to them pertaining to the organization of the Church of God, also pertaining to the doctrine and ordinances, we have had revealed to us, excepting one thing, and that is the principle and power of translation. That, however in, however in due time, will be restored also. And if they, in their day, had built a Zion, we have one to build in our day, and when this shall be done, and everything in readiness, the Zion which the people of Enoch built, and which was translated, will descend from above, and the Zion of the latter days, which this people will build, will ascend by virtue of this principle and power of translation. John Taylor, Journal Discourses 22, 299. If there was anything associated with Enoch and his city, it would be manifested in the last days. If there was anything associated with the Melchizedek priesthood in all its forms, powers, privileges, and blessings at any time or in any part of the earth, it would be restored in the last days. Okay, now let me... Let me pause here for a second. Why is he? Why is John Taylor really stressing this in a couple of times here? Well, the restoration of all things, the restitution of all things, look that up. Do a side study on what that means. That means any doctrine, any principle, any power that was in any dispensation will be returned to the earth in this dispensation, in this generation, actually, before Christ comes. So, this is going to come so that we can actually tra be translated. Okay, so I'm just throwing in my little two cents here. I'm going to go back to the quote. For this is the dispensation of the fullness of times. Did you hear that? This is the dispensation of the fullness of times. That means everything's coming back. Embracing all other times, all principles, powers, all manifestations, all priesthoods, all the powers, therefore, that have existed in any age, in any part of the world, for those things which have never been revealed from the foundation of the world, but have been kept hid from the wise and the prudent, shall be revealed unto babes and sucklings in this dispensation, the fullness of times. 
Okay, Bruce Mark Tom, uh, Bruce R. McConkie, uh, quote, Raphael, whom we assume to have been Enoch or someone of this of his dispensation, came and committed such keys as pertaining to that day. No doubt these include the powers to use the priesthood to translate men, as well as, uh, I'm sorry, as will be the state of all those who abide the day of the second coming. Okay, he's just reiterating everything we've just read from the scriptures, from journal discourses. I know a lot of people have an issue sometimes with the stuff that Bruce Arbaconke is saying, but I, I threw this in here after I've quoted everything else, just so you can see it's a supporting quote. Okay, uh, another one, uh, Bruce Arbaconke. Uh, Jesus and his apostles and all the hosts of believers in their day were all priests after the higher order, which Peter called the royal priesthood, 1 Peter 2, 5-9. But with the martyrdom of the apostles, save John only, the keys of the kingdom were taken from mortals. The priesthood could no longer be conferred upon men, and the long night of apostate darkness fell upon the earth. During that day, only translated beings held the priesthood, and so it continued until those who those arose whose right it was by lineage to claim the holy order again in the day of restoration. Doctrine and Covenants 86, 8 through 11. So study every time I, I list one of these scriptures that they have in their quotes, do a side study on those scriptures. It's exactly what those scriptures are saying. Look at the footnotes, look at the, uh, the cross references. Okay, and I mentioned again in this quote. Holy Order. Study that again, Dr. Combs, 84, 33. Okay. All right. Uh, Brigham Young, Journal of Discourses, 18, 263. The Lord has declared it to be his will that his people enter into covenant, even as Enoch and his people did, which of necessity must be before we shall have the privilege of building the stake, the center stake of Zion, for the power and glory of God will be there, and none but the pure in heart will be able to live and enjoy. Okay, so again, sanctified, pure in heart, right? The holy order. You guys need to study this. Orson Pratt, Journal Discourse 19, 350. We find that after Christ had established his church, that angels continued to minister, and one of the apostles on the certain occasion exhorted the former day saints to be careful to entertain strangers. For in so doing, some had entertained angels unaware. Hebrews 13, 2. And we find that during the first century of the Christian era, angels frequently appeared. Acts 5, 19, Acts 8, 26, and Acts 11, 13. And revelations were given to, and were also given to by the power and the gift of the, the Holy Ghost, which was rested upon the apostles for the guidance of the church. Acts 10, 9 through 16, Revelation 1, 1. Paul also testifies of angels in this wise. Quote, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Hebrews 1 14. Showing us, showing to us clearly and plainly that these celestial inhabitants of heaven, these pure sanctified beings, sanctification again, that dwell in the presence of God, were sent forth as authorized ministers of God to those who should be heirs of salvation here upon the earth. Hebrews 1 14. But by and by, after the first century of the Christian era, the heavens became as brass over their heads again. Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 28, uh, 23. Uh, the voice of inspiration was heard no more. Neither did the voice of angels salute the ears of mortals. Uh, no visions among the people, the veil of darkness that hung over them. In consequence of the Lord's withdrawing his ministering agency from the earth, so befogged their minds that they could no longer gaze upon the glorious future. This state of apostasy continued until about the last half century of the Christian era, and it prevailed more or less among all people. And the priests to whom those people looked for spiritual light and instructions have persisted one and all in teaching the people from generation to generation that the Bible was full, that the canon of Scripture was closed, and that it was no more necessary for angels to communicate with man, nor the miraculous gifts and graces that once adorned the church should be continued. The people settled down to this belief, I would add false belief, without any evidence or testimony of its truthfulness, 
and it became a widespread and popular tradition. I would call it false tradition. And the children, even down to our day, have inherited these notions and traditions of their fathers without once questioning them. They are born in the children, as it were, and they were educated and trained in this belief, and hence it has become deeply rooted and most difficult for them to rid themselves of. Now listen to what he is. So this is, again, Orson Pratt Journal Discourses 19 through 50. So he's telling you that these false traditions have basically told us, and basically the Christian world, that... That these things don't happen. That the heavens are closed, right? Well, what has our prophet been telling us? That the heavens are opened, right? He's been telling us this. Okay, let's look into this a little bit. What's a translated being and what is their purpose? What, what do you think the purpose of a translated being? When you read 3rd Nephi 28, when you read uh, the 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 accounts in Moses about the city of Enoch. What does that sound like when John the Revelator was translated, right? Let's look into this a little bit. The doctrine of translation, characteristics of translated beings. A, like John the Revelator, they will never taste of death, 3rd Nephi 28, 7. They will not experience the pains of death. Uh, Prophet Joseph Smith, translated bodies cannot enter into the rest until they have undergone a change equivalent to death. Teaching the Prophet Joseph Smith, 191. The scripture detailed that three disciples obtained not this promise until after their faith had been shown. Ether 12, 17. B. They will be changed in the twinkling of an eye from mortality to immortality. 3 Nephi 28, 8. C. They will experience no pain while in the flesh. They are not subject to disease or suffering that commonly affect us. However, like God, they do experience sorrow for the sins of the world. 3 Nephi 28, 9. D. The Nephite apostles had their con election made sure. 3 Nephi uh, 28.10. E. Caught up into heaven and saw and heard unspeakable things. 3 Nephi 28.13. They experienced a change in their bodies. While they were no longer subject to the pain and sickness, this change was not equal to that which shall take place at the last day, which is the resurrection, right? 3 Nephi 28, 38, and 39. Wicked or evil men and women have no power over them. Three times the uh, they, they were cast, they cast the chosen servants into a fiery furnace and into the dens of wild beasts, and the Lord delivered them from each time without anything happening to them. Right? That's 3 Nephi 28, 21 through 22. Fourth Nephi uh, 1, 32 through 33. H, if, uh, if they pray to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, they will have the power to show themselves to whoever they desire, and they are as the angels of God, 3 Nephi 28, 30. I, Satan can have no power over them, 3 Nephi 28, 39. J, they were to remain in this translated state until the judgment day of Christ, or till I shall come in the power of, uh, come in the glory, come in glory with uh, the powers of heaven. 35, 28, 7, and 40. Okay, <clears throat> this was compiled by Clyde J. Williams. This is found in the uh, rscwau.edu, Book of Mormon, 35. Okay. Let's move forward. Elder John W. Taylor, son of John Taylor, if you guys didn't know. Okay, this is uh, October 1902. Uh, taken from the Latter-day Commentary of the Book of Mormon, compiled by K. Douglas Bassett, page 463. This is conference report. Okay. You will find that many districts where the elders of Israel cannot reach will, have, will be penetrated by these men who have power over death. My testimony is that these men are going abroad in the nations of the earth before the face of your sons, and they are preparing the hearts of the children of men to receive the gospel. They are administering to those who are heirs of salvation and preparing the hearts to receive the truth, just as the farmer prepares the soil to receive the seed. The Lord has promised that he would send his angels before the face of the servants, and so he does. Um, Joseph Smith Jr., teaching the prophet Joseph Smith, 170. Quote, the doctrine of translation is a power by which belongs to this Melchizedek priesthood. There are many things which belong to the power of the priesthood and the keys thereof that have been kept hid from before the foundation of the world and are hid from the wise and the prudent to be real vi to I'm sorry to be revealed in the last times hereafter. Quote, many have supposed that the doctrine of translation was a doctrine whereby men were taken immediately into the presence of God 
and into the internal fullness, but this is a mistaken idea. Their place of inhab uh, habitation is that of the terrestrial order, and a place prepared for such characters he, God, held in reserve for ministering angels. So I had to throw this in here because uh, when you hear people saying that they were taken to heaven, taken to the bosom of, uh, you have to understand that's a terrestrial order. See, the terrestrial order is considered a heaven. It's, 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 um, it's going to be a heaven. <laughs> Just wait when, when the earth changes to a terrestrial state, you'll see. Uh, Wilford Woodruff, uh, Journal of Discourses 13, 320. To these three, Jesus gave a promise similar to that which he gave John the Revelator. Obviously, he's talking about the three Nephites, right? Uh, namely, that they should tarry in the flesh till he comes, uh, till he came. History informs us that the wicked tried to kill John in various ways, placing him on one occasion in a cauldron of boiling oil, but his life was preserved, and that finally, in the reign of Domitian uh, Caesar, he was banished to the Isle of Patmos to work in the lead mines, uh, the lead mines, sorry. Uh, and while there was while he was there, he was blessed with visions, revelations, knowledge, light, and truth, a portion of which uh, I've recorded in what are called the Revelations of St. John, and the reign of Nerva John was recalled, and after wrote his epistles. So I think I mentioned this in my first video right at the beginning in the uh, Seven Year Tribulation video. Uh, John was writing uh, all of these things while on the island of Patmos. So... Uh, let me go ahead and continue with this quote. Uh, the first quorum of the apostles were all put to death except John, and we were informed that he still remains on the earth. Through his body, uh, though his body has doubtless uh, undergone some change, three of the Nephites, chosen here by the Lord Jesus as his apostles, had the same promise that they should not taste death until Christ came. And they still remain on the earth in the flesh. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about transfigured versus translated, because there's a lot of people, when they read the Doctrine and Covenants, they say, oh, well, this this uh, footnote takes me to quickened, and I looked at quickened, and it says, it's, you know, there's either transfigured or translated. Well, uh, people are getting a little confused because they don't go a little bit further with their studies. So let's talk a little bit about this. What Jeffrey R. Holland says, uh, Christ in the New Covenant, page 306, a person who is transfigured, is one who is temporarily taken into a higher heavenly experience, as were Peter, James, and John, and then returned to a normal celestial status. Okay, there you go. Joseph Smith teaches the prophet Joseph Smith, 170 to 171. The doctrine of translation... Now, the doctrine of translation is a power by which belongs to the priesthood. There are many things which belong to the powers of the priesthood and the keys thereof that have kept hid from the foundation of the world. They are hid from the wise and the prudent to be revealed in the last times. I read that earlier. Many have supposed that the doctrine of translation was a doctrine whereby when men take immediately into the presence of God and into the f eternal fullness. But this is a mistaken idea. The place of his habitation is that of a terrestrial order and a place prepared for such characters. He held in reserve to ministering angels unto many planets and who as yet have not entered into such great fullness who are resurrected from the dead others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection hebrews 11:35 now it was evident that there was a better resurrection or else god would not have revealed it to paul wherein then can it be said a better resurrection this distinction is made between the doctrine of the actual resurrection and translation. Translation obtains deliverance from the tortures and sufferings of the body, but their existence will prolong as to the labors and toils of the ministry before they can enter into so great a rest and glory. So translation is uh, full translation and basically when they're twinkled, right? going from mortality to immortality as if in the twinkling of an eye. That is a greater blessing, right? Read 3 Nephi 28. Uh, it's, it's, it's a greater blessing to um, toil in the labors of the ministry, right? To, to gather. So let's talk about that. Where will we gather? Okay. Zion and the New Jerusalem. 
Joseph anticipated that the temple, oh, sorry, this is from the Church of Jesus Christ.org study section, the history topics, the New Jerusalem and Zion. Joseph anticipated that a temple city such as Nauvoo would serve as the center of gathering, and that the stakes of Zion would be established in many places, each serving as a refuge for the faithful. The Latter-day Saints continued to hope for a return to Jackson County, Missouri. At the same time, the church leaders, such as Brigham Young, taught the importance of building Zion wherever the saints were. Not long after they settled in Salt Lake in the Salt Lake Valley, President Young spoke of their growing city as the New Jerusalem and the rising the Salt Lake Temple as the focal point for the gathering. In the 1950s and 1960s, the church began to establish stakes of Zion in many locations around the world. Describing this effort, Elder Spencer W. Kimball explained that, quote, the first presidency of the Twelve see great wisdom in multiple Zions, many gathering places where the saints within their own culture and nation can act as a leaven in the building of the kingdom. Today, Latter-day Saints gather to local stakes of Zion and build temples in many countries, and church leaders emphasize the importance of becoming a people who live up to the idea, ideals of Zion, unity, godliness, and charity. Wow, this is a big thing, guys. Uh, to be able to be considered... Uh, to be inhabitants in Zion, we have to be unified. We have to be godly and charitable. D. Todd Christofferson, 2008, come to Zion. Zion is both a place and a people. Zion is the first uh, was the name given the ancient city of Enoch in the days before the flood. It came to pass in his days that he built a city and that that was called the city of holiness even Zion. Moses 7.19. This Zion endured for, for some 365 years. See Moses 7.68. Uh, the scriptural record states, and Enoch and all his people walked with God, and he dwelt in the midst of Zion, and it came to pass that Zion was not, for God received it up into his own bosom. Own bosom. And from thence went forth and saying, Zion is fled, Moses 7, 69. Later, Jerusalem and its temple were called Mount Zion. The scriptures prophesy for a future new Jerusalem, where Christ shall reign as the king of Zion, when for the space of a thousand years the earth shall rest, Moses 7, 54 and 64. Uh, sorry, 53 and 64. The antithesis of the antagonist of Zion is Babylon. The city of Babylon was originally Babel, the Tower of Babel fame. Uh, and later became the capital of the Babylonian Empire. Its principal edifice was the Temple of Baal, uh, or Baal, the idol referred by the Old Testament prophets as the shame, given the sexual perversions that were associated with its worship. Uh, the Assyrians and Babylonian Babylon, or Babel, its worldliness and its worship of evil, the captivity of Judah, and the following the, con uh, the conquest of 587 B.C., all combined to make Babylon the symbol of decadent societies and spiritual bondage. Continued, holiness. Much of the work of the uh, much of the work to be done in establishing Zion consists of our individual efforts to become the pure in heart. Again, then you hear that again. So he's saying, in order for us to be able to uh, be considered for Zion. We have to have efforts to become the pure in heart. Individually, he, he just said, okay? Doctrine and Covenants 97, 21. Zion cannot be built up unless it is by the principle and the law of the celestial kingdom, said the Lord. Otherwise, I cannot receive her unto myself. Doctrine and Covenants 105, 5. The law of the celestial kingdom is, of course, the gospel law and covenants which include our constant remembrance of the Savior and our pledge of obedience, sacrifice, consecration, and fidelity. Do, do you understand what he's saying here? Um, if we're going to remember the Savior and our pledge of obedience, sacrifice, consecration, and fidelity, right? he's not talking about being uh, fidelity in marriage. He's talking about fidelity with Christ. Okay, Study that. Every single time Christ is referred to as the bridegroom and we are his bride, that we can't cheat on him. We can't go uh, whoring after other gods and, and become 
the Babylonians and, and worship these pagan idols? We can't. We cannot. We're going to receive the covenant curses. All right, let me continue. <clears throat> okay, so the Savior was critical of some of the early saints for their lustful desires. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants 101, 6, and see uh, Doctrine and Covenants 88, 121. These people were who lived in a non-television, non-film, non-internet, non-iPod world, in a world of um, now awash in sexualized images and music. We are free from lustful desires. Uh, I'm sorry, are we free from lustful desires and their attendant evils? Far from pushing the limits of modest dress or indulging in vicarious immorality of pornography, we are to hunger and thirst after righteousness. To come to Zion, it is not enough for you or me to be somewhat less wicked than others. We are to become not only good, but holy men and women. Recalling Elder Neil A. Maxwell's phrase, let us once and for all establish our residence in Zion and give up the summer cottage in Babylon. He quoted uh, Neil A. Maxwell, A Wonderful Flood of Light, 1990. Okay, let's continue. He goes. For, he, he keeps going here. Caring for the poor. Therefore, if any man shall take of the abundance which I have made, and impart not of his portion according to the law of the gospel, unto the poor and the needy, he shall, with the wicked, lift up his eyes in hell, being in torment, Doctrine and Covenants 104, 17, 18. See also Doctrine and Covenants 56, 16, and 17. Furthermore, he declares, In your temporal things you shall be equal, and this not grudgingly, otherwise the abundance of the manifestations of the Spirit shall be withheld. Doctrine and Covenants 70, uh, 14. Also Doctrine and Covenants 49, 20, and 75, 5 through 7. We might ask ourselves, living as many of us do in societies that worship possessions and pleasures, whether we're remaining aloof from covetedness and the lust to acquire more and more of this world's goods, materialism is just one more manifestation of the idolatry and pride that characterize Babylon. Okay, so you really have to study um, the false traditions uh, traditions of men in the gospel topics. You really have to study what, what, what Elder D. Todd Christopherson is talking about. And so he emphasizes that, that idolatry and pride is pretty much plaguing us right now and says that materialism is just one more manifestation of idolatry and pride that characterizes us. And he's he's going to kind of help you understand here. Perhaps we can learn to be content with what is sufficient for our, for our needs. The Apostle Paul warned Timothy against people who suppose that, quote, that gain is godliness. 1 Timothy 6, 5. Uh, he said, quote, we brought nothing to this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Quote, and having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. 1 Timothy 6, 7 and 8. In much of the world, we are entering upon unsettled eco economic times. Let us look after one another and be the very, very best we can. I remember the story of a Vietnamese family that fled to Saigon in 1975, ended up living in a small mobile home in Provo, Utah. Okay. D. Todd Christofferson continued. All right. Preparing the Lord's return. Preparing for the Lord's return, April 2019. I know a lot of you remember this one. It was pretty awesome. Let's go into it. Uh, in that day in infant shall not die until he is old and his life shall be as the age of a tree when is he talking about obviously he's talking about in the millennium okay and when he dies he shall not sleep that is to say in the earth but he shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye and he shall be caught up and his rest shall be glorious dr covenants 101 30 31 what can we do to prepare now for that day we can prepare ourselves as a people we can gather the Lord's covenant people. What, what, what did he just say? Gather the Lord's covenant people. So we, we've been used to hearing a lot of people saying, gathering the Lord's elect, gathering from the four corners here. Now we're gathering the covenant people. This was in 2019, guys. Okay. And we can help redeem the promise of salvation made to the fathers, our ancestors. All this must occur in, the, in some substantial measure before the Lord comes again. First, 
and crucial for the Lord's return, the presence of the, of a presence on the earth of a people prepared to receive him at his coming. He has stated that in uh, that those who remain upon the earth in that day, from the least to the greatest, shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, and shall see eye to eye, and shall lift up their voice, and the voice together sing this new song, saying, The Lord hath brought again Zion. The Lord hath gathered all things in one. The Lord hath brought down Zion from above, and the Lord hath brought up Zion from beneath. In ancient times, God took the righteous city of Zion to himself. By contrast, in the last days, a new Zion will receive the Lord at his return. Zion is the pure in heart. How many times have we heard this already? A people of one heart and one mind dwelling in righteousness with no poor among them. The prophet Joseph Smith stated, we ought to have the building up of Zion as our greatest object. While we strive to be diligent in building up Zion, including our part to gathering the Lord's elect and the redemption of the dead, we should pause to remember that it is the Lord's work that he is doing. He is the Lord of the vineyard, and we are his servants. He bids us labor in the vineyard with our might this, quote, last time. This was in 2019, I, I, might I remind you. And he labors with us. Did you hear what he said? And he labors with us. It would be probably more accurate to say that he permits us to labor with him. This great and last dispensation is building steadily to its climax. Again, that is the second time we've heard that, right? Prof the prophet said that as well. Zion on earth being, being joined with Zion from above at the Savior's glorious return. The Church of Jesus Christ is commissioned to prepare and is preparing, not will be, is preparing the world for that day and his return to reign for a thousand years of peace. Let us be about building up Zion to hasten that day. Wow, this is so powerful, guys, because number one, when was the last time you heard pretty, pretty heavily that we need to start building up Zion? It needs to be now. There's so much talk about becoming like the city of Enoch and being translated like the city of Enoch. Let's continue. Let's look at the footnotes, okay? So footnotes of the Doctrine and Covenants 6, 6, and 11, 6 that was mentioned say, Now as you have asked, behold, I say unto you, keep my commandments and seek to bring forth and establish the cause of Zion. So it can't, I mean, not only did we just read it in his talk, but now even in the footnotes, Right In these scriptures that he's using, it says it pretty clearly that we need to be able to keep the commandments and seek to bring forth and establish the cause of Zion. If you've never studied Zion, do it now. Footnotes, Doctrine and Covenants 97, 21, 26. Therefore, verily I say unto you, verily thus saith the Lord, let Zion rejoice, for this is Zion, the pure in heart. There you go again. That's where it comes from. Doctrine and Covenants 97, 21 in the Latter-day Scriptures. Therefore, let Zion rejoice while all the wicked shall mourn. So what's happening here? I'm going to, well, I'll talk about it in the next slide. <laughs> uh, a little bit of a separation, okay, that we keep hearing about from the prophet. Okay, so the, the Zion's going to rejoice and the wicked is going to mourn. 22. For behold, lo, uh, vengeance cometh speedily upon the ungodly as a whirlwind, and shall and who shall escape it? The Lord's scourge shall pass over by night and by day, and the report thereof shall vex all people. Yea, it shall not be stayed until the Lord come. For the indignation of the Lord is kindled against their abominations and all their wicked works. Nevertheless, Zion shall escape if she observe to do all things whatsoever commanded her. Not 90%. Not, well, I can do this because my neighbor does this. Zion shall escape if she observe to do all things whatsoever I've commanded her. But if she observe, but if she observe not to do whatsoever I've commanded her, I will visit her according to all her works with sore affliction, pestilence, plague, sword, vengeance, with devouring fire. Okay, this is what we're talking about, right? The wheat and the tares explained. Uh, this is from the Church of Jesus Christ.org, the study section, Leahona, 1995. 
Wheat and tares explained. When Jesus' disciples were alone with him, they asked him to explain the parable. Jesus said that the sower of the good seed represented himself and the apostles, uh, and, the, and the apostles, the field represented the world. The good seed, his righteous followers, and the tares, those who follow Satan. Satan was the sower of the tares. The harvest represented the end of the world, and the reapers represented angels. Right now, good and bad people are allowed to grow together, but at the end of the world, angels will separate the righteous from the unrighteous. The unrighteous, those who, uh, those who have chosen to break the commandments, will be punished and will wail and gnash their teeth. However, the righteous, those who have chosen to keep the commandments, all of them, I will add, will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Matthew thirteen forty three. When we come to earth, we are given the freedom to choose between good and evil. It is up to us to choose whether we will be like the wheat or the tares. Okay, are the wicked enough? Are we wicked, wicked enough to have the covenant curses upon us? Let's take a look here. Boyd K. Packer, the pure defense, uh, the one pure defense, two thousand four. This is uh, the teaching manuals for seminary. Uh, you'll find it in the churchofjesuschrist.org study section. The world is spiraling downward at an ever-quickening pace. I am sorry to tell you that it will not get better. It is my purpose to charge each of you as teachers with the responsibility to put you on alert. These are the days of spiritual danger for our youth. <laughs> Guys, this was like, this was back in 2004, Okay. I know of nothing in the history of the church or the history of the world to compare with our present circumstances. Nothing happened in Sodom and Gomorrah which exceeds in wickedness and depravity that which surrounds us now. Words of profanity, vulgar, vulgarity, and blasphemy are heard everywhere. Unspeakable wickedness and perversion once were hidden in dark places. Now they are in open and accorded legal protection. At Sodom and Gomorrah, these things were localized. Now they are spread across the world and they are among us. I need not, I will not identify each evil that threatens our youth. It's difficult for man to get away from it. Okay, there you go. Now you know that uh, we're more wicked than the Sodom and Gomorrah. That was back in 2004. You know how, how things have got even more corrupt since then. Elder Dallin H. Oaks, where will this lead? Oh, this is epic. Okay. April 2019, a handsome squirrel, uh, handsome tree squirrel with a large bushy tail playing around the base of a beautiful hardwood, a hardwood tree. Sometimes it was on the ground, sometimes it was down and around the trunk. But why would that familiar sight attract a crowd of students? Stretched out, prone on the grass, nearby was an Irish setter. It's a dog. He was an object of the student's interest, and the squirrel was the object of his. Each time the squirrel was momentarily out of sight circling the tree, the setter would quietly creep forward a few inches and then resume his apparently indifferent posture. This was what held the students' interests. Silent and immobile, their eyes were riveted on the event. These outcomes were increasingly obvious. Finally, the setter was close enough to bound at the squirrel and catch it in his mouth. A gasp of horror rose, and the crowd of the students surged forward and wrestled the little animal away from the dog. But it was too late. The squirrel was dead. Anyone in that crowd could have warned the squirrel at any time by waving their arms or crying out loud, but no one did. They just watched while the inevitable outcome got closer and closer. No one asked where will this lead. When the predictable, when the predictable occurred, all rushed to prevent the outcome, but it was too late. Tearful regret was all they could offer. That true story is a parable. This is what he's saying. That true story is a parable. As we see threats creeping upon, upon persons or things we love, we have the choice of speaking or acting or remaining silent. Where the consequences are immediate, and serious, we cannot afford to do nothing. We must sound the appropriate warnings and support appropriate preventative efforts while there is still time. That's pretty bold. Okay. Will we know? Uh, will we know it's time together physically? Let's take a look at some of the things here. Okay, Elder 
uh, this is this is what we hear from some modern day apostles. If that wasn't enough, uh, uh, Elder H. Uh, Aldred, Aldridge Gillespie, uh, Elias Business College Devotional, February eight, two thousand five. We must both learn and learn what these signs are, and then identify them correctly when they occur. They can and will strengthen our faith in Christ and His apostles, uh, His prophets. If we know the scriptures, this is something I always, you know, there's a lot of people that ask me for my advice or my, you know, my understanding. Guys, I, I'll i point you to the scriptures. Repent, get on your knees, repent, pray, ponder, search. You will get the answer from the Holy Ghost. This is personal information, I'm sorry, personal revelation, personal inspiration that you need to receive so that you can act on it. Don't lean on anyone's understandings. These are my study notes. That's what this is. You guys need to get your own study notes. You guys need to do your own studies. You guys need to follow the promptings of the Spirit. Okay, let me go back to the quote. Just in the days of Noah, a way is already prepared for the escape of the Lord's elect Latter-day Saints, if they are in tune with his prophets. Wow, another one. This is insane, right? Henry B. Eyring. Raise the bar, January 2005. The Lord has prepared places of safety to which he is eager to guide us. It will be our choice whether or not to move up or stay where we are. As we have Benson, prepare ye, 1974. For the righteous, the gospel provides a warning before a calamity, a program for the crisis, a refuge for each disaster. Okay, Henry B. Eyring, 2020. You guys remember this one, Prayers of Faith. We as a people will become more united among, amid cr increasing conflict. We will be gathered in spiritual strength of groups and families filled with gospel light. Wow. Again, that's found on the Church of Jesus Christ.org study general conference. Henry B. Eyring again. This was back in 2015 general conference. There seems to be no end to the Savior's desire to lead us to safety. And there is const uh, constancy in the way uh, he shows us the path. Uh, he calls by more than one means so that it will reach those willing to accept it. And those means always include sending the message by the mouth of his prophets where, whenever people have qualified to have the prophets of God among them. Those authorized servants are always charged with warning the people Telling them the way to safety. The Prophet Joseph Smith recorded in his history. Up to this day, God had given me wisdom to save the people who took counsel. None had ever been killed who had abided by my counsel. History of the Church 5, 137. Okay, that's pretty insane. So, Henry B. Eyring was quoting Joseph Smith saying that None had ever been killed who had abided my counsel. You can't move off of fear. You have to move off of faith. And you have to know exactly what the promptings mean. Let's, let's move forward. Watchful into prayer continually. David David e. Bittner at General Conference, October 2019. You guys remember this? The parable of the topi, right? Quote, stay awake. Be alert. Spiritual complacency and casualness makes us vulnerable to the advances of the adversary. Spiritual thoughtlessness invites great danger into our lives. Okay, now, uh, before I give you this quote, I'm just going to give you the uh, understanding of the cheetahs and the topi. So basically, um, there's a group of topis. There's some leader topis who are standing on mounds who basically are the ones watching. And they see the danger. And this is what happens. Somehow a warning was given and all the topis moved to a place of safety. This pattern of pursuit continued. They did not stop. They did not rest or take break. They were relentless in following their strategy of distraction and diversion. So the distraction and diversion, remember, the cheetahs, they would go in there. Their, you know, one would pop up above the grass as the other one is creeping closer. And then simultaneously that one would pop down and another one would pop up which would give a distraction for the other one to move forward, right? They continued this progress of distraction and diversion so that they could attack. But the leaders, somehow a warning was given, 
and all the Tobys moved to a place of safety. We need to understand these aren't just stories that come across the pulpit. We need to understand these are parables for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, understand what's happening here. Let's move forward. Come follow me, the Lord, uh, the Lord's counter strategy and uh, proactive plan. Okay. <coughs> okay. So the goal is to uh, let, me, let me go over that again. The goal is not to make church one hour shorter. It is to make church six days longer. Now consider again the warning our prophet, President Nelson, gave us as he opened October 2018 General Conference. The adversary is increasing in his attacks on the faith, on faith and upon us and our families at an exponential rate. To survive spiritually, we need to counter strategies and proactive plans. Then, Sunday afternoon, he closed with the conference with his promise as he diligently worked to remodel your home into a center of gospel learning. Now, now remember this, because I'm going to refer to this a little bit later. As you diligently work to remodel your home into a center of gospel learning. Now, he's telling you, you have work to do. Your home is not right. You need to remodel it. If you don't, you're not going to be able to make it. This is what he's saying. The influence of the adversary in your life and in your home will decrease. Okay, becoming exemplary uh, Latter Day Saints and Zion or Leahomona, right? Uh, Twenty eighteen. How can the attacks of the adversary be increasing exponentially while at the same time the influence of the adversary is actually decreasing? It can happen, and it is happening throughout the church because the Lord prepares His people against the attacks of the adversary. So He just told you, uh, Mark L. Pace, Twenty nineteen, just said that it's happening now. That separation of wheat and tares, wicked is happening at exponential rates, and righteous are happening. Righteous people are increasing in higher levels of spiritual growth. That's what he's saying. It can happen, and it is happening throughout the church because the Lord prepares His people against the attacks of the adversary. That's that's exactly what he's saying. Okay, an anchor to the souls of men. Howard W. Hunter, twenty uh, twenty ten March Enzyme. Uh, this was in the enzyme, but it obviously was from 1993 originally. I promise you in the name of the Lord, whose servant I am, that God will always protect and care for his people. We will have our difficulties but, uh, the way every generation of people have had difficulties. But with the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have every hope and promise and reassurance. The Lord has power over his saints and will always prepare places of, safety, uh, places of peace, defense, and safety for his people. So, guys, I, I've, I've given so many quotes already about this. Uh, do you understand yet? Does, does this, is this starting to make sense? Uh, th this should be pretty obvious by this point. It's obvious. If you're a righteous saint, there's places prepared for safety for his people. Let, let me kind of get into the, the scriptures now. The book of Isaiah. They who conduct themselves righteously... They shall dwell on high, and the impregnable cliffs are their fortress. Bread is provided them, their water is sure. Isaiah 33, 14 through 16. Let's jump over to Isaiah 57, 1 and 2. The righteous disappear, and no man gives it a thought. The godly are gathered out, but no one perceives it that from the impending calamity the righteous are withdrawn. They who walk uprightly shall obtain peace and rest in their beds. Did, did you understand that? I mean, I know sometimes Isaiah is a little bit more difficult to understand than, you know, something from First Nephi. But this is pretty plain here. The righteous disappear and no man give it a thought. The godly are gathered out, but no one perceives that from impending calamity. The righteous are withdrawn. That's pretty simple English. That's pretty identifiable. That's good detail. The Way of Safety, Henry B. Eyring, 2015. One of the reasons why the Savior has provided priesthood keys so that those with ears to hear and faith to obey could go to places of safety. Study this whole talk, by the way. It's called The Way to Safety. It's, it's amazing. Okay. Be you also ready. 1989 Enzyme. Okay, you can find this on the churchjesuschrist.org study section. 
All right. <clears throat> when the Roman legions destroyed Judea and Jerusalem in, in AD 70, Josephus, if, if you don't know who Josephus is, he was the... Um, um, he, he had really good records at the time. He was um, um, a, an ancient Jewish historian. Okay. And he's quoted quite a bit from our apostles and prophets, and I'm assuming that's why uh, the they put him uh, they they put this information in here. So Josephus says that there are more than 1.1 million Jews perished, and nearly 100,000 were taken captive. Yet while the Jews suffered starvation, slaughter, and capture, their fellow Christians in Jerusalem escaped. Did you hear that? Okay. So do you remember what happened around that time? I'm sure you did. How how were the Christians spared? About 37 years before the destruction, Jesus had foretold the terrible events that would follow his death. He warned his followers, or Christians, I'm going to add in there, to immediately flee Jerusalem when the signs he predicted occurred. The Christian community carefully watched for the signs that followed the Savior's warning. The Lord then taught of the two major signs that would alert believers to flee. Quote, when you shall see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, then you know that desolation thereof is nigh. That's found in Luke 21, 20. He also said, when there, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop come down uh, not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Matthew 24, 15, 18. Uh, of the abomination of desolations to which Jesus referred, Daniel wrote, uh, They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. That's found in Daniel eleven thirty one. 31. Again, this is B also ready. Safe in his hands, God warned Noah of the flood and told righteous how to escape. God told Joseph in Egypt of the coming famine and how to prepare. That same God speaks today through his prophets, giving counsel that brings peace and safety when followed. Every dispensation has seen tumult and war and terror and want. And to every dispensation, the Lord has sent prophets to warn the wicked, warn the wicked, and reassure and prepare the righteous. It's no different in this great and final dispensation. That's found the church of Christ.org, the study section, Enzyme 2010, safe in his hand. This is Luke 17, 26 to 28. There will be people getting married until the day people are gathered out. And I am put this slide here because, well, I've been working on this... Uh, <laughs> this video uh, since last year, basically. But um, I want you to understand why the temples will be open for marriage during this time, because people keep thinking, oh, the temples need to be 100% closed for, for this, for, for Daniel's prophecy to be fulfilled. Well, you need to look at this and understand what's happening. Luke, Luke chapter 17, verses 26 to 28. And as it were in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Uh, this is in Luke, not the Old Testament. So he's talking about the second coming of the Son of Man. Okay. Verse 27. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Verse 28. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought and they sold and they planted and they built it. Okay, now understand, he's making this comparison. Luke 17 is making this comparison. Why? Because temples right now are open for people who are getting married, right? It's fulfillment of this prophecy. That, that's a, the point I'm trying to make here. Let's move to Doctrine and Covenants 97, 23, 26. Okay. The Lord's scourge shall pass over by night and by day, and the report shall thereof shall vex all people. Yea, it shall not be stayed until the Lord come. For the indignation of the Lord is kindled against their abominations and all their wicked works. Nevertheless, Zion shall escape if she observe to do all things whatsoever I have commanded her. 
But if she observed not to do whatsoever I have commanded her, I will visit according to all works, sore afflictions, pestilence, plague, sword, with vengeance, and with devouring fire. D DNC uh, 132, 49 through 50. For I am the Lord thy God. I will be with thee even to the end of the world and through all eternity. For verily I seal upon your exaltation and prepare a throne for you in the kingdom of my father with Abraham your father. Behold, I have seen your sacrifices. I will forgive all your sins. I have seen your sacrifices in obedience to that which I have told you. Go, therefore, I shall make a way for your escape as I, ex as I accepted the offering, Abraham, of his son Isaac. Okay, so another quote again showing you that we're going to be able to have a way to escape. Okay, this is a good one. Elder Bednar, um, when he came to himself. Now, there's some pretty amazing things here. You need to pay attention and do a side study on this as well. Okay, um, this was uh, June 17, 2020. Uh, this was to the um, uh, the BYU Law School Religious Freedom Annual Review. A wake-up call. The parable of the prodigal son describes the experience of a young man who became lost, subsequently found his way back home. Uh, please note two key aspects of this young man's experience. First, he became he, he began to be in want. Uh, when a mighty famine arose in the land. Okay, so you need to apply this to what's what's going to be applicable here. Okay, He began to be in want when a mighty famine arose in the land. As this natural calamity unleashed its negative effects, I presume his inheritance was gone. I also imagine that many of his friends who had enjoyed his, com his companionship while he had plenty of money had long since told him goodbye. He may have been homeless, uh, but un ultimately it was the famine and his resultant hunger that constituted a strong wake-up call. So what is exactly is he telling us? He's saying that there's going to be a wake-up call, we're going to be hungry, and there's going to be a famine. Let's go back to the quote. He was shaken awake from the customary patterns of his lifestyle by increasing realization of his inability to fulfill his most basic needs. Second, the young man's wake-up call led him to come to himself. This point of phrase suggests to me that the process of examination of aspects of his life that previously had been unexamined, resulting in a piercing personal re realization of his present circumstances that what he had become. He was also willing to strive uh, for a time when need needed course correction. Quote, I will arise and go to my father, unquote. Our world has seemingly been filled recently with strong wake-up calls from natural disasters, deadly pandemics sweeping the globe to most pernicious social plague of racism. We are daily reminded that we need to awaken to the perilous times that surround us, come to ourselves, and arise and turn to our Divine Father who desires to instruct and edify us through our trials. COVID-19 constraints can be blessings. Just as the famine for the prodigal son was a pivotal turning point in his life, so COVID-19 can help us realize that we have not, we have not fully realized before. Uh, the right to gather with the faithful. One key realization is that uh, for most of the faith communities, gathering worship, ritual, and fellowship is essential. It's not merely just an enjoyable social activity. For example, gathering is an especially powerful element in the doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. A central mission of the Church is to gather together uh, the scattered family of Abraham, and indeed all who are willing. To the ordinance of the covenants of the Savior's Gospel, those uh, through that gathering, we believe God will establish a people who are uh, of one heart and one mind, who dwell together in righteousness and peace, and who love and care for each other so completely that no poor, spiritually or physically, are found among them. In ancient and modern scripture, the Lord calls such people and such a place Zion. Zion is where, quote, the pure in heart dwell. Again, there's another pure in heart. You guys need to study that. And it is where God himself can dwell in the midst of his people. We believe that such a gathering is essential before the Messiah returns again. So it's pretty, it's pretty telling when they keep going into this, right? 
Let's let's look at this. This is from the Church of Jesus Christ dot org. Church news: Shelter in place spiritually and physically. Elder Holland, uh, April one, twenty twenty. Therefore, let your hearts be comforted concerning Zion. For all flesh is in mine hands. Be still and know that I am God. Zion shall not be moved out of her place. They shall come to inheritance. They and their children with songs of everlasting joy. Doctrine and Covenants one hundred one sixteen eighteen. Songs of everlasting joy in the middle of such tribulation? Yes. And why not? There's a lot to be joyful about. As we refine our faith, trust more in the Lord, and see the miracle of his deliverance. This is amazing, right? Okay. <clears throat> the principle of gathering. If we deeply, uh, if we thought deeply about the events of the, the centennial year, perhaps we were stirred by the realization that we were, that we were but commemorating the operation of principle that is old of human family, a principle that has been invoked by the command of the Lord every gospel dispensation. I refer to the principle of gathering. The first reference we have in the revelations to gather of the Lord's faithful people is that spoken of by Adam gathered together his seven righteous sons from Seth to Methuselah and all their posterity in the valley of Adam on Diamon. And there he gave them his last blessing and prepared them for the appearance of the Lord, which they received at that time. Dr. Incumbents 107, 53 to 56. I've thought it more than mere coincidence that one of the first martyrs in this dispensation, W. W. Patton, a member of the Twelve Apostles, lost his life near the Valley of Adam on Diamon. That same valley in which Adam had gathered his posterity, which the Lord had revealed to the Prophet Joseph Smith, was near uh, White Ferry, a place called Spring Hill, Dallas County, Missouri. To me, it has also been significant that this martyrdom resulted directly from the obedience of the Latter-day Saints to com uh, the commands that they had been given to them to gather in certain places as members of the newly restored church. It was the lament of the Master just before his crucifixion, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, that stoneth uh, them that are sent to thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. And you would not. That's Matthew twenty two thirty seven. Apparently, the master was referring to the repeated revelations he had given to the prophet from Adam down to his time, in which he had told uh, of not only the scattering of his children of Israel, but also the subsequent gatherings. To Jeremiah, he had promised, "I will take you one of the city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart." which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Jeremiah 3, 14-15. To Ezekiel, he said, I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries therein, wherein you are scattered. And with a mighty hand, and with a stretched out arm, and with a fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. There will I plead with you face to face. Ezekiel 20, 34-35. To the prophets Isaiah and Micah, uh, he told of the time when the mountains of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. Isaiah 2, 2, Micah 4, 1. In uh, apt description of those who would be gathered thus by the command of the Lord, it's given the parable of the master when he said that the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net, and that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full... They drew to shore, sat down, gathered uh, the good into the vessels, but cast the bad away. Matthew thirteen forty eight, uh, forty seven through forty eight. Are you kind of starting to see here the the understanding here of what's happening? Uh, what the scriptures actually mean? These parables that were taught, right? The gathering in this dispensation for the first commandment to gather in this dispensation with six months after the church was organized. The prophet Joseph Smith is announcing this re revelation made this significant declaration as recorded in the history of the church. Soon, uh, we soon found that Satan had been lying in wait to deceive and seeking whom he might devour. Uh, the meaning of that revelation, the purpose of it was explained in these words that, uh, and that ye are called to bring past the gathering of mine elect. For mine elect, hear my voice, harden not their hearts. Did, did you hear that? So the elect are those who 
hear my voice and harden not their hearts. Now, what type of announcements would we harden our hearts to? What, why would we harden our hearts to the prophets and apostles? Well, obviously, the only reason we would harden our hearts is if we are not on the path, right? If we follow our own understanding, I guess you could say. Okay. Um, and... Wherefore, the decree hath gone forth from the Father, that they should be gathered into, in unto one place upon the face of this land, to prepare their hearts and to be prepared in all things against the day when tribulation and desolation are set forth upon the wicked. For the hour is nigh, and the day soon at hand, when the earth is ripe, and all the proud, and they that do wickedly, shall be as stubble, and I will burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. That they do wickedness shall not be upon the earth. As Doctrine and Covenants 29, 7-9. through 9. Three years later, the Lord again spoke on this subject. It is my will that all they who call upon my name and worship me, according to my everlasting gospel, should gather together and stand in holy places. Doctrine and Covenants 101, 22. Thus the Lord uh, has said plainly to his saints that the gathering was to, per to prepare their hearts. Quote, according to the everlasting gospel, unquote, and to be prepared in all things, quote, by standing in holy places, unquote. Six years after the church was organized, the keys of gathering were committed to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cattery in the Kirtland Temple. The record of that marvelous restoration was given in these words. After this vision closed, the heavens were again opened unto us, and Moses appeared before us and committed the keys of the gathering of Israel and the four parts of the earth, and leading of the ten tribes from the land of the north. Huh. Doctrine and Covenants 1, 10, 11. The spirit of the gathering has been with the church from the days of the restoration. Of that restoration. restoration. Those who are of the blood of Israel have a righteous desire after they are baptized to gather together with the body of the saints that uh, at the designated place. This we have come to recognize is but the breath of God upon those who are converted, turning them to the promises made to their fathers. That's Doctrine comes to two places of gathering. But the designation of gathering places is qualified in another revelation by the Lord to which I would desire to call your attention. After designating certain places in that day where the saints were to gather, the Lord said this, Unto the day cometh when there is found no more room for them, and then I have other places which I will appoint unto them. That's in Doctrine and Covenants 101, 21. Did you understand that? So he's saying that there's places of safety, and when there's no room f there, wherever there is, uh, I don't know if, if you want to go more into detail, but I will. Um... It'll be the next couple slides, but just pay attention to the verbiage there. Uh, there's other places of safety. Okay, let's move forward. It would be well before the frightening events concerning the fulfillment of God's promises and predictions are upon us that the saints in every land prepare themselves and took forward the instructions that shall come to them from the first presidency of the church as to where they shall be gathered and not be disturbed in their feelings until such instructions is given to them as it is revealed by the Lord to the proper authority. Okay. Continue. Refuge from the storm. Again, in 1838, the Lord gave a further reason for the gathering. Uh, Verily I say unto you all, arise and shine forth, thy light may be a standard for the nations, uh, and that the gathering together upon the land of Zion, upon her stakes, may be for a defense and for a refuge from the storm. And for wrath, when it shall be poured out without mixture upon the whole earth, Doctrine comes 115, 5 through 6. Why is this to be called a place of refuge, place of safety? Doctrine comes 45, 66. Said the Lord in another revelation, The glory of the Lord shall be there, and the terror of the Lord shall be there, insomuch that the wicked will not be able to come into it, and it should be called Zion. Doctrine comes 45, 67. And the time when these things shall be, would be as the Lord said, when the wicked shall slay the wicked, and fear shall come upon every man, and the saints shall 
hardly escape. Nevertheless, I, the Lord, am with them, and will come down in uh, come down in heaven from the presence of my Father, and consume the wicked with unquenchable fire. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants sixty three thirty three through thirty four. Another and further reason for the gathering is given us with this revelation. Wherefore, seeing that I, the Lord, have decreed all these things upon the face of the earth, that I will, that that will I, my saints, should be assembled upon the land of Zion, and that every man should take righteousness in his hands and faithful faithfulness upon his loins, and lift a warning voice into the inhabitants of the earth, and declare both by word and by flight that desolation shall come upon the wicked. Dr. Covenant 63, 33, uh, 36 through 37. As we sit here today, we should be mindful of the fact that we are those who of, of whom these revelations have spoken. We are those who have been gathered from out of spiritual Babylon. Dr. Covenant 133, 14. Or perhaps we represent the second or third, or even the fourth or the fifth generation of those who heeded the call and felt the spirit of gathering just as was the case the days of the prophet Joseph Smith. So in our day, the leaders of the church have told us that, quote, Satan has been lying in wait to deceive and seeking whom he might devour. Okay, warnings of dangers. <clears throat> as I have thought about these things, I have been sobered by the realization that during my lifetime, three presidents of this church have spoken on these dangers which are within the church which are seeking to destroy us and defeat the purpose of our gathering. It was President Joseph F. Smith who said, There are at least three dangers that threaten the church within. The authorities need to awaken to the fact that the people should be warned unceasingly against them. As I see these, they are flattering and prominent men in the world. False educational ideas and sexual impurity. Okay, did you hear those three things? Okay. Flattery of the prominent men in the world. Have you ever, I don't know, been to a uh, testimony meeting where someone's quoting Michael Jordan or someone's quoting someone who has nothing to do with the gospel? I have. It's a little, it's a little sketchy. Um, here's another one. Um, education, false educational ideas. We see that going on right now in the schools, right? And then the third one he says is sexual impurity. That's huge. Okay, let me continue with the quote. But the third subject mentioned, personal purity, is perhaps um, of greater importance than either of the other two. We believe that one standard of the moral, morality of men and women, if purity of life is neglected, all other dangers set in upon us like the river's uh, what? Like like the rivers of waters when the floodgates are open. Gospel Doctrine, 1939 edition, page uh, 312, 313. It was President Grant, during this declining years, who repeatedly, in all our conferences and in all his addresses, urged upon the Latter-day Saints to keep God's commandments time and again, impressing upon us that there was no greater mission for him to perform as President of the Church than to warn the Latter-day Saints. By divine inspiration, he directed a movement to build brotherhood in this day, uh, designed to foster the greatest security possible in this material world. Much has been done to bring about the full purposes of the church welfare program before it's too late, in order to provide that defense, that the refuge from the storm and from the wrath when it's poured out without mixture upon the whole earth. Dr. Covenants 115.6 President George Albert Smith, who presides over us today, has repeatedly counseled the authorities of the church and in his public addresses spoke, uh, has spoken of the dangers that are confronting the homes of our people today. The carelessness of marriage out of the church and out of the temple, the lack of the sanctity of marriage, and the lack of understanding of the sanctity of the marriage covenant, the increase of divorce among us, the failure to hold sacred, the covenants that which made the house, uh, the covenants we have made in the house of the Lord, we might, uh, well, might we remember the warning of the Lord to John, the revelator, when he said, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed he, blessed is he that watcheth, and is keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, 
and they see his shame. So let me just talk about that for a second here. That's a Revelation sixteen fifteen. So remember the the the, the people of the Watchtower, the uh, the the people who were supposed to be awake, the Watchmen uh, were supposed to be awake on the on the on the towers. They were supposed to have the fires burning, right? And they were supposed to not make sure they were supposed to basically have um, the fires burning all the time and supposed to warn if there was a thief coming in to break into the temple to steal all the gold, the, the altar, like, you know, the everything was valuable, right? So um, if one of those people, one of those individuals were sleeping, the, the servants were sleeping and, and, you know, the fire burnt out, the coals on these towers, uh, the high priest would come by, uh, you know, three o'clock in the morning, something like that, and catch a slothful servant sleeping. They would put the coals on the uh, on the garments or the the raiment, the jackets of this slothful servant, and it would burn up. I don't know if they didn't know the stop, drop, and roll method. I don't know, but they would run through the city naked, and that that's what this is referring to. That they would see his shame, right? So we can't be caught unaware. We can't. If we're unprepared, if we're not watching and waiting, not studying the signs and understanding scripture and understanding what the prophets and apostles are saying, we have to be watching. We have to be. Let me go back to the quote here. As I think the counsel of these, our leaders, have been given us from time to time, I have been reminded of a story told of a president of one of our great universities in Nova Scotia who called his representatives to him and sent them out to teach a great principle to humble the fishermen of that land. His parting counsel to them was, if you want to educate a man, you have to let him see a ghost. Okay. Defense against evils. May the Latter-day Saints be haunted, if it need be, by the memory of those who pioneered the work of the gathering this is of this dispensation be haunted by the memory of the teachings of the work of Adam to Moses of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and others who of the prophets of the purposes of which God has been restored which the Lord told us in his preface of the revelations was because he knew the calamities which were about to come forth upon the children of men Doctrine and Covenants 117 may we as a people see the ghost of our possibilities that which we might be able to accomplish our own strength and ability to stir up to deeds of righteousness, to build a greater brotherhood, of, to provide that defense against the evils that threaten to destroy our homes today. May we do all this in preparation for the coming of the Son of Man, which I pray, God, may not be long delayed. God speed us in that preparation while it is yet day and increase within us the, step of the testimony of the di divinity of the work in which we are engaged. And as we may live in the day and the terrors and the trials and the struggles all foretold by the prophets come to pass when fear shall be upon all uh, to fear shall be upon every man. Doctrine and Covenants sixty-three thirty-three, and when it shall seem that there is no place safe upon the earth, may Latter-day Saints who are living the commandments of God be comforted again by those words which the Master has comforted those who have lived before in similar times. Be humble. The Lord will take you by the hand, as it were, and give you the answer to the prayers. Doctrine and Covenants 112.10 Be still and know that I am God. Psalms 46.10 uh, Doctrine and Covenants 101.16 For I bear you, Psalm witness, that I know these things told by the prophets are true. I know that those who have counseled us in our day, the dangers that are before us, have spoken uh, by the prophets of the, whole, of the living God. And I bear you this testimony humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, let's move forward. Are you wheat or tare? Jesus sometimes taught uh, using parables. Parables are short stories that use familiar things to teach the gospel truths. Uh, this is uh, churchofjesuschrist.org, study, Leahona, 1995. Uh, one parable is that Jesus taught while he was in Galilee. Uh, Galilee was about the wheat and the tares. It's kind of a weed. Uh, Jesus said that a man who had a field planted good wheat in uh, what? Sorry, uh, <laughs> Jesus said that a man who had a field planted good wheat seed in it, while he slept, someone came and planted tares, which look a lot like wheat as they grow uh, in the same field. All the seeds started to grow, and the blades of the wheat and the tares 
broke through the ground, and a worker in the field noticed that the tares were growing with the wheat. He asked the owner, Didst thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then uh, hath it tares? Matthew thirteen twenty seven. The owner of the field said that the enemy must have planted the tares. Okay, remember the enemy is Satan. When the worker asked if the tares should be pulled up and destroyed, the owner said no. If the tares were weeded out, he explained that a lot of the wheat would be destroyed too, since they were growing side by side. So the wheat and the tares were both allowed to grow until harvest time. Then the owner, the reaper, uh, the owner told the reapers to first gather and store the wheat safely in a barn. After that was finished, they were to gather the tares unto bundles and burn them. Okay, Matthew twenty four thirty one, forty forty one. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall sound together together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. And the and then they shall be two of the field, and one shall be taken, the other one left. Two women shall be grinding the mill; one shall be taken, the other one left. So, you guys understand this. Uh, this is um, the parable. Uh, well, first off, let me, let me help you understand, uh, verse 31, trumpets are an announcement. Trumpets were used, the shofars were used from ram horns, uh, in ancient days as announcements. When that announcement sounds and there's going to be a gathering of the elect, this is going to be pretty big. This is going to be something that we need to be in tune for. Okay. So what are the modern day apostles and prophets? saying let's do this again um president russell m nelson moving forward october 2020 increased gospel study in many homes and resulting in stronger testimonies i pray that we as a people are using this technique time to grow spiritually we are here on earth to be tested and to see if we will choose to follow jesus christ to repent regularly to learn and to progress our spirits long to progress and we do that best by staying firmly on the covenant path. President Russell M. Nelson, embrace the future with faith. I would love to know what you have learned this year. Have you grown closer to the Lord? Uh, or do you feel further away from Him? And have you cur and, and how have current events made you feel about the future? Admittedly, the Lord has spoken of our day in sobering terms. He warned, uh, he warned that in our day, men's hearts would fail them. And even the very elect would be at risk being deceived. He told the prophet Joseph Smith that peace would be taken from the earth and calamities would befall mankind. How are we to deal with these somber prophecies? If ye are prepared, ye shall not fear. What a promise it is that one can literally change the way we see our future. I recently heard a woman deep testimony admit that the pandemic, combined with the earthquake in Salt Lake Valley, had helped her realize that she was not as prepared as she thought she was. When I asked her whether she was referring to her food storage or her testimony, she smiled and said, yes. If preparation is our key to embracing this dispensation and our future with faith, how can we best prepare? For decades, the Lord Prophet who have urged us to store food, water, financial reserves for a time of need. The current pandemic has reinforced these, this wisdom of the council. I urge you to take steps as to be temporally prepared, but I am even more concerned about your spiritual and emotional preparation. In that regard, we can learn a lot from Captain Moroni. As commander of the Nephite army, he faced opposing forces that were stronger, greater in number, and meaner. So, Moroni prepared his people in three essential ways. Now, I want to break from the quote for a second and emphasize what he's telling us here. <coughs> Let's continue. First, he helped them create areas where they would be safe. Places of security, he called them. Second, he prepared the minds of the people of faith, uh, of the faithful, uh, the minds of the people to be faithful unto the Lord. And third, that never stop preparing his people physically or spiritually. Moroni fortified every Nephite city with embankments, forts, and walls. When the Nephite, when the Lamanites came against them, they were astonished exceedingly because of the wisdom of the Nephites in preparing their places of security. So, before I move forward, 
um, <clears throat> he's basically said that uh, that the church has places of safety already set for us. That's what he he just said that Moroni fortified every Nephite city with embankments, forts, forts, and walls. There's already places of security there. That's what he just said. Okay. Second, he prepared the minds of the people to be faithful to the Lord. So that's what the prophet's telling us right now: to be faithful to the Lord. To be, seek to be taught by the Lord himself. That's a quote, right? Uh, and third, never stop preparing his people physically and spiritually. Okay, now let's move forward. Keep those in mind. Similarly, as turmoil rages around us, we need to create places of uh, places where we are safe, both physically and spiritually. When your home becomes a personal sanct sanctuary of faith, where the Spirit resides, your home becomes the first line of defense. So, if our homes are the first line of defense, where's the second and third? I'm just, you know, thinking out loud here. That's our first line of defense. But there's always second and third. You, you know this. You know this. Okay, let's continue. Um, likewise, the stakes of Zion are a refuge from the storm. Okay, so he's just mentioned the stakes of Zion. Refuge from the storm. Because they are led by those who hold the priestly keys and exercise priesthood authority, as you can feel the presence of the Holy Ghost and guided by. Okay, so there you go. Homes, stakes of Zion. What's next? Okay. <clears throat> um, those uh, the Lord authorized to guide you, and you feel greater safety. Simply said, a place of security is anywhere. You can feel the presence of the Holy Ghost and be guided by Him. When the Holy Ghost is with you, you can teach truth, even when it runs counter to prevailing opinions. And you can ponder sincere questions about the gospel in an environment of revelation. Huh. Well, you can't really have an environment of revelation if the entire city is, you know, getting divided by political debates, by, uh, by, you know, mandates by uh, closures, by restrictions. You know, there has to be somewhere else. And, and we've already gone through all of that information, right? Okay. Um, and as you ponder since your questions about the gospel uh, in environment of revelation, the Lord placed you here and now because he knew you had the capacity to negotiate the complexities of the latter part of these latter days. I'm not saying that the days ahead will be easy. But I promise you that the future will be glorious for those who are prepared. He just gave us some pretty essential information here. He's telling us that the days ahead will not be easy. And he is saying that he promises that the future will be glorious for those who who are prepared because why because the wicked will mourn that's why okay let's go back let us not just endure this current season let us embrace the future with faith turbulent times are did, did you hear what he just called turbulent times that's what he's calling us what we're in right now turbulent times are opportunities for us to thrive spiritually there are times when our influence can be much more penetrating than in calmer times. I promise that as we create places of security, prepare our minds to be faithful to God, and never stop preparing. Those were the three things Moroni did, right? Okay. God will bless us. He will deliver us. Yea, in so much that he will speak peace to our souls and will grant unto us great faith and cause that we can hope for our deliverance in him. As you prepare to embrace the future of faith, these promises will be yours. I so testify with my expression of love for you and my confidence in you in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Okay, so like I was mentioning, if our homes are to be the first line of defense in which we were told to remodel our homes. Remember I said we'd talk about this later. What will be the second and third line of defense? Well, the second he saw it, the stakes of Zion. And then what's the third one? Maybe the last resort? Physically? Okay. That's what we've been talking about. Search, ponder, and pray about that. 
Um, that's something that the Holy Ghost will have to testify to you. That's a um, that's something that we've already discussed. But as far as when to go and where to go, that's like I've given in the quotes, gonna be from from the leadership from um, from the stakes of Zion and from personal revelation. So that's something that, that not like any like your friend or your neighbor is gonna tell you. You know what I mean? You're not gonna get a text message from a buddy. Hey, we're we're building this place over here. You know, you gotta you gotta join us. No, that that's not how it's gonna happen. We've just read all the quotes about how it's going to happen. Now, I know everyone's excited for this one. Uh, we're running out of time here. <laughs> We've already gone over two hours. Sorry about that. Okay, Henry B. Eyring, Sisters in Zion, October 2020 General Conference. This was in the women's session, if you remember. Here's the Lord revealed description of what would happen to Enoch's people and what will happen in this dispensation of the fullness of times. And, in, and the day shall come when the earth shall rest, but before that day the heavens shall be darkened, and the veil of darkness shall cover the earth, and the heavens shall shake, and also the earth, and the great tribulation shall be among the children of men, but my people will I preserve, and righteousness will I send out out of heaven, and truth will I send forth out of the earth, to bear testimony of mine only begotten, his resurrection from the dead, and yea, also the resurrection of all men righteousness and truth will I cause to sweep the earth as with a flood to gather out mine elect from the quarter, four quarters of the earth unto a place which I shall prepare a, a holy city that my people may gird up their loins and be looking forth at a time of my coming for there should be my tabernacle and it should be called Zion a new Jerusalem and the Lord said unto Enoch thou shalt all thy city meet there and we will receive them into our bosom, and they shall see us, and we will fall upon their necks, and they shall fall upon our necks, and we will kiss, kiss each other. Now remember at this time, when Henry, Elder Henry Biaring was giving this address, he was crying in conference when he said this. You know he's got an absolute testimony about this. Let's go back. And there shall be mine abode, and it shall be Zion, and it shall come forth out of the, out of all creations which I have made. And for the space of a thousand years, the earth shall rest. You sisters, your daughters, your granddaughters, and the women you have nurtured, will be at the heart of creating that society of people, who will join in glorious association with the Savior. Did he say your children's children's generation? No, he said you sisters. That's what he said. It always kills me when I hear people say, yeah, we have about a hundred years till Savior comes. You sure about that? You sisters, your daughters, your granddaughters. This is happening right now. We have to be prepared for this. Let's go back to the quote. You will be the essential, an essential force in the gathering of Israel and in the creation of Zion. People who dwell in the peace in the New Jerusalem. Enix was a day of wicked, wickedness and evil. A day of darkness and rebellion. A day of war and desolation. A day leading up to the cleansing of the earth by water. Enoch, however, was faithful and he saw the Lord. He talked with him face to face as one man speaketh with another. Moses 7 4. The Lord sent him to cry repentance to the world. Enoch made covenants and assembled a congregation of true believers, all of whom became so faithful of the Lord come and dwelt with his people. And they dwelt in righteousness, and they were blessed from on high. And the Lord called his people Zion. Moses 7 18. Enoch built a city that was called the city of holiness, even Zion, and Zion was taken up into heaven where God received into his own bosom. And from thence went the saying, Zion is fled, Moses 7, 19, 21, and 69. I testify that you are citizens of the Lord's kingdom on earth. Uh, wow. Wow. Did you hear that? I testify that you, you are citizens of the Lord's kingdom on earth. The Lord's kingdom on earth is Zion. You're citizens of Zion? 
Not our children's 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 generation. This is insane. This is this is amazing. This is one of the most amazing talks, and this was just in October 2020. Let me continue. I, I just think it's just so in, impressive and amazing that they go into so much detail, right? You are daughters of a loving Heavenly Father who sent, uh, who sent you into the world with unique gifts that I promise you use to bless others. I promise you. And the Lord will lead you by the hand through the Holy Ghost. He will go before your face as you help him prepare his people to become his promised Zion. I so testify in the, name, in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Wow. So this is what uh, what it shows here. Uh, the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. See the differences. Um, this is just on the church website. Um, you can pause and look through this. Uh, but here it is. I'm just going to show you. Notice the article's form <clears throat> from 2016 tells us how to prepare for the second coming. Repent. Baptize with water. Um, and... Uh, Baptism of fire, the Holy Ghost. Stand in place in holy places. Receive truth. Take the Holy Spirit for your guide. Do not be deceived. Hear the voice of the Lord, the servants, uh, and give heed to the words of the prophets. This is from the Church of Jesus Christ New Era 2016. Just wanted to show this to you. These are additional references. We're at the very end. Just going to let you know that this is something that you can basically um, put pause on and uh, go through each reference for your personal study. I'm not going to go into this. I'm just going to show this to you. This is from the president, uh, the, the president Russell M. Nelson, the future of the church, preparing for the world's uh, preparing the world for the Savior's second coming. You can pause, read it yourself, or just look it up. It's uh, the Church of Jesus Christ dot org study, Leahona, 2020. That's when he uh, gave this. Also, here is here are um, a bunch of other references. You can find references from the book of Revelation, Isaiah, um, Doctrine and Covenants, Psalms, Omni, uh, Alma, Joel, um, President Hinckley, Oaks, um, just all of these two. You can put pause on this slide as well. Um, this is basically showing all these other references. I've named a few of them, but then I do want you to study each of those. So these as well. I'm not reading any of these, but uh, these are additional references.